Hello, welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online conflict transformation summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. My name is Nuno da Silva, and I'm here today with Stephanie Mines. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Nuno. Welcome, my dear, welcome. I'm so happy you, you answered our call and, and joined us for this interview. Stephanie is, is a, a neuropsychologist, you have an amazing story of personal transformation who has led many people to become deeply committed to a healing journey. You've been exploring shock and trauma from many different perspectives. You've worked with it as a survivor, as a professional, as a healthcare provider, and then also training staff and institutions and agencies. You've been blending Western and Eastern modalities and looking for the best of both paradigms. And you've been devoting uh, to ending this lineage of shock and trauma that moves on from individuals and, and generations out into the world. And this has led you to develop the Tara approach for resolution of shock and trauma, which is taught internationally and is clinically tested and comprehensive treatment design. And you also have developed the climate change and consciousness our legacy for the earth, where you convened the global gathering in Northern Scotland last year in April with amazing keynote speakers. Next iteration will be in 2021. You've wrote several books. I just mentioned a couple of them. We are all in shock, new frontiers in sensory integration. And most recently, they were families, how war, how war comes home. There would be much more to say, but I think the best would be that we actually hear a bit from you about how has been how how has your life journey led you to this kind of work? What, what was what was those stepping stones that that led you here? Thank you, Nuno. And this question has been resonating with me ever since you posed it, and I feel that I actually was born into conflict, uh, that this theme of conflict resolution is actually the theme of my life, and that I was born into the conflict between my mother and my father. Uh, I was born into the conflict between my mother's family and my father's family. I was born into the conflict of a world war. And I believe that I specifically chose all this conflict to bring forth a path of conflict resolution. And I hadn't thought of my development that way until you invited me to be part of this very significant event. So I thank you for that, Nuno. <laughs> thank you so much. So. Yeah, it seems it seems you had an intense life. Um, I, I guess I guess if if I could say so, most most of us grown up in conflict, right? I, I can I can definitely relate to it when I hear you talking about conflict between father and mother. Really relate to that. Uh, could you tell us a bit of in this path you've been working with? So you've decided to focus on on shock and trauma, and I, part of it most probably because you went through. You, you wanted to, to, to also work with them in, in your own journey. Um, could you tell us a bit of what have you been finding out of, about the nature of shock and, and, um, and trauma, how that relates with conflict, and maybe after that we can go a bit on what kind of approaches you've developed that can help people to navigate this in a, in a more healthy way? Yes. So. My curiosity about the origins of trauma, the origins of conflict, which you might say is another word for trauma. Conflict represents a breakdown, a fragmentation, uh, and trauma is also a fragmentation, a splitting, uh, a state of adversity, and shock would simply be the 
most extreme level of that. So my curiosity about that really is what has driven everything uh, on my path. The curiosity and a state of inquiry, I think actually has saved me from being consumed by the debilitating impacts of shock and trauma. And that curiosity has led me to an intersection, which is the intersection of the emotional psychological, physiological, and spiritual aspects of conflict. So that I approach the whole question that is posed by this event that you have created with your colleagues. I I approach it physiologically, actually, and through zeroing in on a physiological definition of shock and trauma. In other words, it's uh, neurodynamics and the mind-body interface that results from those neurological events and sequences and the neurohormones associated with that. Landing there in that physiology, surprisingly, has given me my greatest hope and my, what I feel Uh, is my greatest discovery, which is the innate nature of resilience. Mm. That resilience is programmed physiologically into our structures, into all of our structures. So yes, I'm speaking neurologically. The capacity for resilience neurologically is documented, but that same capacity for resilience is in every aspect of our bodies, our joints, our connective tissue, our limbs, uh, every aspect of function has the potential for resilience, and that is biological. So landing there, which was very surprising to me, uh, has allowed the threads of science, spirituality, and I would add creativity to all be woven into the tapestry of human life. Wow. How how you came about that? You were you were investigating like the the physiological uh, impacts of trauma and shock and and the reactions that the body was was um, was taking in 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 face of those situations. And can you give us a bit of more juice on that? Like what what is it that you that you find out? Because I know I know for instance things like homeostasis that our body always tries to maintain the ideal. Uh, conditions to thrive. So maybe it has something to do with those kind of functions, but maybe you can tell a bit more. Yeah, I will uh, try to create a concise chronology that will be very personal um, about how I arrived at what I believe is scientific. The uh, nature of my personal process was that As I mentioned, I was born into a highly conflicted state, uh, literally what I would describe as a rape conception. There was, I mean, my parents were married, but the conditions of my conception were violent. uh, and, And my mother was utterly unprepared for this kind of violent experience. And she was also, uh, in a situation that had no resources for her. And my father's behavior was very conflictual, very, he was conflicted within himself uh, and he was conflicted with her. And I was the product of that conflict. So that evolved into a conflicted upbringing, a early development that had virtually no attachment, uh, I would 
uh, score very high. I do score very high on the ACES test. Uh, and the end result of that really was that I had a, a difficult life, difficult relationships, difficult circumstances, uh, some of which were life-threatening. Uh, and my curiosity and my creativity, thank God, were innate to me and kept me inquiring into why I was making all of these choices. And that did lead me ultimately to getting my doctorate in neuroscience. It was preceded by other kinds of studies. Um, research and study has been a lifesaver for me. Thank God this curiosity has allowed me to be educated. And my earlier inquiries were more in the area of history, literature, writing, uh, poetry, and creativity in the form of dance, movement studies, I was ex always exploring uh, both intellectually and somatically. But once I became a neuroscientist with a focus on trauma resolution and, and that area was further specialized for quite some time in the treatment of sexual abuse, uh, victims of rape uh, and domestic violence. Those were areas where I focused for quite a while and led still by this curiosity about why people make those kind of choices to enter into these highly conflictual, often violent situations. And by following the thread of that curiosity, I actually landed in understanding neurodevelopment from an embryological standpoint. So I'm always in my inquiries, always looking to the source of root causes, you know, kind of unpeeling the onion back and back and back uh, and looking at trauma repetition at, you know, vicarious re-traumatization, secondary traumatization, which is the subject of, of my book, They Were Families, How War Comes Home, looking at how trauma influences neurodevelopment. That's the sensory integration book. This deep inquiry led me ultimately to understanding how the brain develops in utero. And in looking at that, looking at the very origins of neurodevelopment, mm -hmm. I saw that the nature of early life, prenatal life, is incredibly conflicted, is incredibly stressful. So the, the developing being, us, each one of us, we, we each have our own odyssey. Uh, on this journey, mm -hmm. we encountered difficult circumstances. There, there, there's no way that uh, prenatal life, which is often portrayed as blissful, yeah, and there are moments as quite peaceful and protecting environment. And I mean, I, there, I know it from a different perspective because I've seen my my twins growing up in, in a tight space and kind of conflicting with each other on, on their development. So, Yes, so this is beautiful. And I've been thinking about your twins as I have been imagining going into this topic <laughs> uh, because their story really proves the point that I'm making. So, you know, not everybody was a twin, but more people were uh, twins than uh know it, and this is scientifically yeah. documented, and, and you're aware of this research, being the father of twins, you likely have encountered this, and because twins run in your family, mm -hmm. uh, you've likely encountered this, that many women lose a twin uh, before they even recognize it. Yeah. So more people were a twin uh, than know it, but whether you are a twin or not, there are definitely moments uh, in which your prenatal life is blissful. 
And those are the more spacious moments. Space and bliss seem to go together. Um, <laughs> you know, the non-compressive states yeah. are more conducive to an experience of bliss, which is associated with being undifferentiated in other where it's being part of the whole, uh, which is the state all of us are longing to return to, uh, in which we sense somatically the feeling of oneness, of, of unified consciousness, mm-hmm. of undifferentiated consciousness. But as the prenatal experience becomes more and more compressive and more and more restricting, then each one of us navigates that geology uniquely, but those of us who survive beyond that stage, we found a way to do that. We found a way to shift structurally, to shift directionally, to soften, uh, to evoke space to find where the spaciousness might be hidden. Mm -hmm. And that is a victory journey that everyone alive today has experienced. We're all victors. We're all triumphant over enormously conflictual situations. And that applies on every level that I investigate. So it's true, literally like a geology, you know, like, finding your way through a cave in the dark or kayaking is another metaphor, Mm -hmm. you know, navigating uh, threatening waters. But it's also true very often emotionally and spiritually and psychologically because of the different conflicts that pierce the placental barrier uh, through the umbilical cord, just as the nutrients that the mother is consuming a travel into the territory, the womb space that the baby inhabits. So the conflicts between parents, grandparents, and the conflicts in the world at large uh, penetrate uh, energetically and vibrationally uh, into the very sensitive and absorptive world uh, of the developing prenate. We are remarkable in finding resilient solutions to these various stressors. And it's unpredictable. There's some predictability, some structural information that can be uh, documented, that is documented. You know, there are certain pelvic shapes, for instance, that we know about. uh, So we can anticipate some of the challenges that we encountered. But for the most part, it's a very unique and often, if not in the majority of cases, an untold story that we found this resilience within ourselves. Yeah, and I'm thinking, and and you've been talking only of the prenatal, and I'm thinking like the moment of birth is really, really traumatic for, I mean, everybody talks about it. In wonders, and I think, well, it's more or more less traumatic depending also on the context you are in, of course. And and I find out a lot about that because our our experience was very was was a bit traumatic. And and then and then I'm thinking like because we 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 we, we cannot go every stage, but like every stage of growing up, and humans are unique in the sense that we have the longest time to be ready to to be autonomous, yeah, because we have all these years of development, but that's also at the same time, and in a way I think it's part of what you're saying, is what what gives us resilience because we are really, we learn to adapt to the environment we grow up in. So since the moment we, we get out of, already in the womb, and then we get out of the womb, and then, but in that in that journey of, of, uh, of reaching an autonomous um, time of becoming adults there's a lot of traumatic experiences on the way right so i just remember one of uh, the first experiences of babies when the mother is not around and they start to realize that the mother is not part of them that is not like all there for them all the time and there's many others on the way so 
the question is like obviously we get we get to adulthood and we start we start to see these things i mean we we start to see some dramas unfolding and often connect with those things in 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 early life and you've mentioned a bit around that that we have to develop patterns right so what in your work have been you've been doing to to work with this like how can we be in a place that we kind of acknowledge that we all carry traumas from birth and from uh, before birth prenatal birth and then growing up what can we do to to become more healthy thank you yes and I'm so glad you mentioned the stunning teachings of uh, the birth experience, uh, these formative shaping experiences really calibrate our nervous system. And we tend to repeat uh, what in uh, neuroscience is known as the formula that what fires together is wired together. and you mentioned this yourself, this creates patterns. So it is the curiosity about these patterns and the differentiation between the patterns themselves, which frequently lead to repetition, so frequently lead to conflict. uh, What came before the patterns? In other words, what was the original impulse to incarnate that was met so readily, often, not always, but often by some level of conflict. What was the original impulse that is the privileged experience of each individual being? So that is the what I would call the original brilliance that we all came here to manifest. Is it possible to clarify that outside the patterns of repetition uh, that we all engage in and identify with? Can we identify with that original brilliance? And that is the process that I support and that my work more and more in a climate of incredible conflict, uh, incredible threat, um, has led me to the definition of my original purpose, which I now feel more thoroughly committed to and more thoroughly cognizant of than ever before. Uh, how, How do we find that for ourselves and more fully step into the embodiment of that original purpose so that the conflict no longer becomes part of our identity but the purpose is our identity so it's it's a bit like you not you don't get overly um, directed by what you want to avoid and you start to be more directed towards what you want to bring to life what is your what is the purpose that you want to that uh, that you want to do in the world right Yes, and this understanding that you've just so beautifully articulated is as simple as what you have articulated and matches indigenous understanding of human life. So if I look at the oriental medicines that I've studied and that I incorporate into the practices that I provide for people to get to this original purpose, those practices lead us to finding the central channel in our body. So I'm, I'm literally pointing or illustrating or moving through what this central channel is. Mm. Uh, So that central channel, which is described in neuroscience as the midline that develops in utero and connects the spinal column to the brain that central channel contains the indigenous sensations of original purpose, original brilliance. And we can access that. We can access the wisdom, which is in sensation, is non-cognitive, non-verbal, is experienced 
in an indigenous manner through sense, through knowing, knowing beyond language. We can access that and then that central channel becomes what grounds us in the beautiful Mother Earth body that supports us and links us to a universal consciousness, a global consciousness, a consciousness beyond the individual. Those two become unified through this central channel and that allows us somatically to step into purpose. And when we are there, we somatically experience that, then the resolution of conflict becomes rather easy and fluid. And I I say this as someone who, as I mentioned at the beginning, was born into conflict. I I can tell you uh, it's the subject of a novel I have temporarily put aside, but I have lived through extraordinary political conflicts. I am someone who some people might describe as a person who generates conflict because I challenge. I challenge the status quo. I challenge patriarchy. I challenge uh, common thinking that I feel is fraught with error and deception. I am unhesitatingly challenging. Um, My husband frequently (laughs) describes me that way. Uh, And I have in many ways, you know, thrived on conflict because it, it generates unique thinking. But the more I step into this midline, the more that I inhabit the purer nature of my purpose, the more I can deflect conflict or fluidly move through conflict. So I'm, I'm speaking very personally here. No, no, but it's, I mean, thank you so much for, for opening up and, 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 and telling a bit about your story. And, and I, I think this is what you're saying is really relevant because is, is for one thing for me is like, it's not like you, the, the, the objective there's no idea here about avoiding things, avoiding conflict, or is really looking at comfort. You said you said something just now that said like conflict allows for unique solutions, allowed you for unique solutions to emerge or for unique possibilities. So definitely that's something that is coming up from some of our conversations within this summit, that is that to that we start to look at conflict as something that it's unavoidable in many cases, but it's actually part of life, part of the living process. Although we can, on for one side, be more able to be more aware of when we are uh, starting to enter in, in a in a potential conflictual situation, and work it through in a way with the right conditions for for it to be uh, hold by by the the parties involved um, or or have the help of someone to to help but the the that we the, there's it's a continuing interaction iteration of working also with tensions and that's what the part i wanted to actually bring is because if tension is part of of the of, is what makes us move in a way so we need if if you don't go and question the status quo, the status quo will keep itself kind of static, monolithic, you know, stuck somehow in its own uh, way, way of seeing the world. So it needs this kind of ten- tensors. And I was thinking like, actually, even though we, think we talk about trauma and shock, m- maybe those tensors in, in the belly, in the womb, and then the tensors we live as we grow up, they are... In, uh, part of our uh, of our upbringing of, of growing up, the, the the problem we have is that we have a culture and a society who has not worked through collectively and individually on healing, on working on this in a way that is healing, so that we don't move generation of the generation in families in perpetuating these things. Yeah, so this is all really relevant. 
to my work and to the resources that I have to offer and to my choice to really zero in on inner climate transformation uh, as a path of conflict resolution. And I am not at all speaking of ending conflict because as you were saying, uh, conflict generates new ideas. So the capacity to be in conflict harmoniously uh, is what I am cultivating and what I'm experiencing physiologically. And I really emphasize the physiological and somatic aspect of this kind of evolution, that this is a bottom up, not a top down Mm -hmm. experience. And that statement applies to my whole understanding of how we are going to move forward into the world we want to inhabit, that it is a bottom up and not a top-down experience. So literally bottom up from Mother Earth uh, is the way it's happening and bottom up in that it is led somatically. Uh, And, you know, there's so many ways in which this metaphor of bottom up applies. Uh, And what I'm experiencing, and, and I will speak very personally here, Uh, What I'm experiencing physiologically is, for instance, the way I deal with conflict is what's shifting. It's not that conflict doesn't occur. Of course not. But it's the way that I experience the conflict and the way that I relate to the conflict that is changing for me personally on a physiological level. So. I spoke, and I again, using the prenatal and birth experience as a template, as a metaphor, as a mirror, you know, I spoke about how we find resilience through softening. So very often what has to happen as the prenate uh, or the prenates are finding their way alone or together through the geography that they have inhabited, um, the way that they're able to get to the new place they need to go towards is by softening. So that's the experience that I'm having, uh, that the compressive or rigid states uh, that I thought were uh, maintaining my identity can soften so that, you know, I I just give a very simple example. So the nature of the world that those of us who really care about being active and moving towards the more beautiful world we know is possible, uh, that process is highly collaborative. There's no other way to get to that space except through collaboration. So collaboration means that we encounter people and ideas that we don't like or that bother us or that, you know, activate or trigger us. Um, And what I'm finding is that when that happens for me, I am organically softening as opposed to retracting. So means you are more able now these days to become earlier aware, so aware on an earlier stage of some sort of uh, body arousal, of some some stiffness, or because that's what you do when you are feel threatened, like you kind of closing, and you are able to then do something, most probably with breathing, right? And so maybe some other things, maybe you can tell us that allows you to get into that place of more of relaxing. Well, what what is really fun for me to know uh, that I am really, really thoroughly enjoying it even surprises me uh, is that when I am activated, not 100 percent of the time, but pretty close uh, when I'm activated or upset or um, disagreeing. Uh, that 
I don't go into that state. I just see it and then it softens. It just melts. It doesn't mean that the disagreement or the different position or the challenge to that, whatever it is, doesn't occur. It it does occur and I deliver whatever it is I want to deliver in a much softer way. Uh, so I believe if I look at that from a nervous system standpoint, I believe that what has happened is that the extreme adrenalization that was my survival mechanism in response to threat has now found equanimity, that I am not generating uh, adrenaline, the level of threat that I'm experiencing is appropriate to the situation. It's not the past experience in which virtually every threat was life threatening. So, so I, I grew up in this state that had very little safe space. Uh, and I have actually amplified through my own practices and my own awareness. I have amplified my internal safe space. So I am less threatened by threat, which yeah. I believe is the fearlessness that we need to move forward. It's some sort of physical and psychological flexibility. I was thinking we, we are getting close to the, the end of our beautiful time together. And so just to recap a little bit of the thing. So, yes, definitely... Uh, Conflicts and tensions are part of life. We talked about that they are spaces of, that they are moments and, and, and places of, of opportunity or of possibility, let's say more than opportunity, of possibility, creating new, new things. And, and we've unavoidably in our, in our development path uh, go through, accumulate traumas and, and different things and depending on our experiences some shocks and and then we kind of tend to avoid those so we got triggered in different situations and what I got is we need individually or personally to to become to be as aware as possible so really to work I think as a kind of a base, basis for all this is self-awareness of our body and physical sensations so developing this kind of sensory um, acute attention or acute, acute awareness and then so that we can see okay we're getting triggered I'm getting irritated and we can allow that allow allow not allow to get ourselves possessed by that or let, overwhelmed by that and just give some, maybe a step back or take a deep breath or and I'm thinking in terms of a, of a, of a situation with more people like in a group and there's a conflict emerging Sometimes there's this tendency, let, let's talk this through and kind of sort this out. And sometimes we just need is something that uh, can can allow that adrenaline and the, the things that the energy of, that is kind of building on to just kind of dissipate. That can be, a, can be sometimes something funny that someone says to break out the steam or can just be, let's all breathe and, you know, stop this for a moment or... I don't know. I'm just thinking about some of the things I'm thinking in groups. Uh, if you want to like share some other insights on what people can do practically before we finish, would be great. Yes, and what I am very privileged to offer all of those listening and participating in this event are practices that I would say go even deeper than an instruction, you know, let everybody breathe because some people will breathe and they'll get more in touch with how activated they are. Mm -hmm. So what I have collected uh, into what I call a cultural library of resources. So these are multicultural resources that actually speak directly to the nervous system. So we want to communicate physiologically, you know, beyond content, we communicate to the nervous system function that is habitually reacting to threat as the threat that is from the past. 
So we come into the present using interventions, which I will share, very simple interventions. Uh, this one that you see me doing a lot is one of it. It's one that people have used for centuries, but it has meaning because the connective tissue of the fingers and the palms of the hands actually send messages, uh, bioelectrical messages to major energetic pathways in the body, in the mind body, and bring them into harmony. So I do this very often as coming into that midline that I spoke of. And you can place, this is called an inju in the Japanese system of jinshin that I have translated for the nervous system. Uh, this literally brings you into your heart center in this position, into your prefrontal cortex in this position, and into your thyroid, your throat chakra in this position. So you can place this alignment posture or inju wherever it's needed. And you get instant physiological feedback. And this taps us into what I said at the very beginning, which is the innate resilience that overcomes that literally through a very fluid movement of organic change allows us to not feel threatened, but to move fluidly through these dynamics. We are living in the time of the greatest threat that humanity has ever known. To step through this portal fearlessly, we need to experience fearlessness in our own nervous systems so that we balance the secretion of adrenaline and cortisol. We step as the unprecedented leaders, each one of us is meant to be. That is an inner climate shift that transforms the outer climate. I know that this is possible. Wow, thank you so much, Stephanie. That was beautiful. I think it's the perfect place to, to make a, a pause on this until we continue in another time this conversation. Thank you so much. I loved it. Those of you listening to us, Get your hands on, on some of the material that is together with this interview on the page that Stephanie so, so gently offered to us. Thank you so much once again for your time and for your generosity and, and, and uh, bringing your, your wisdom, your, the learnings of your life to, to us and to this audience. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you, Nuno, for inviting me and giving me this incredible opportunity. 